Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus and his disciples one day, a Sabbath day, Saturday morning, were out walking in the grain field, say a wheat field. And his disciples started plucking the grain. And Jesus was asked, why are you allowing your disciples to pluck grain on the Sabbath? Now, according to Exodus chapter 34, uh, harvesting is forbidden on the Sabbath. And so a strict understanding of harvesting, even plucking grain, uh, that would be forbidden. However, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, there is a caveat, a provision, that you can pluck with your hands the head of a grain, but not use a sickle, not use a, a tool, an instrument to be harvesting. So you can't be working, but for your own personal use, if you want to pluck some with your hand, you could. So the question to Jesus is really, are you a conservative or are you a liberal when it comes to your interpretation of the law? Do you look to Exodus 34 or Deuteronomy chapter 23 and look for inruns around what God is trying to say? Or are you going to be strict about keeping God's word and God's law? Are you a conservative or are you a liberal? Jesus won't fall into either camp. He refuses. And he says that the rules don't apply to me. I'm Lord of the harvest. Now I got to tell you, that answer didn't sit well with the conservatives or the liberals. <laughs> Both of them were looking to the scripture, right? They might in interpret it differently, but both were wanting to lift up the scripture as the word of God and to come and say that has no authority, I'm the authority, <laughs> that didn't sit well with anyone. And then he goes on to say, and besides all of that, we were made for the Sabbath, for its keeping, the Sabbath was made for us. It just didn't sit well with anyone. The very next story in Luke chapter 6 is that Jesus on another Sabbath was teaching in a synagogue when there was a man with a withered or crippled hand that was there. And all the scribes and the Pharisees were watching Jesus closely to see if he would heal the guy. They were looking, it says, for an opportunity to bring an accusation to accuse him of something, right? We do the same, don't we? Especially during times of political campaigns. Liberals looking at conservatives, conservatives looking at liberals, trying to find fault in the other candidate, trying to look for some ammunition to tear them down. We look and have been trained to look for the worst in people. It's as old as the Bible. It's as old as humanity. <laughs> and it's still going on. Now that's not to say that we may not be critical and judge things that we shouldn't and in fact should. But how often are we looking for the worst in people? Looking for a reason and excuse to accuse. They come to Jesus and they're looking for an opportunity to trap him. And he plays right into their hand. No pun intended, the whole withered hand thing. But he plays into their hand. He says, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to save a life or destroy it? Well, of course, their response would be, <laughs> that's just the point. It's not lawful to do anything, good or bad. You're not supposed to do anything. To which I think Jesus is saying in this story, well, but isn't that criminal? There ought to be a law against that, to do nothing, inaction, to turn a blind eye, to see a problem or somebody in need and not do anything, not speak up or do anything about some injustice, to let it go. There ought to be a law against that. We come on Sunday mornings and we confess just a minute ago, not only our sin of what we've done wrong, but we confess what we leave undone. All of the good things that we could have done, that we should have done, but we didn't. We failed to do. We left it undone because ah, it would have cost us time or money or it would have put us out or we would have been associated with something we don't agree with or whatever the case. But all the things that we know we could have done, that we should have done, that would have been right for God and for the neighbor, but we failed or refused or didn't want to. 
We confess that as sin. So Jesus called the guy over. And he healed the man's hand. And right away, all of the people of God, all of the people of faith, were filled with fury and began to talk with one another about what to do to this guy. Not what to do with this guy, but what to do to him. All of these people of God and people of faith were filled with anger that turned to hatred and was looking to violence. There is something twisted about all of that. About people of faith, the people of God justifying violence to other human beings all in the name of God. A Christian bombing an abortion clinic. A Muslim jihadist flying a plane into a tower because of those evil Americans, those sinful American ways. Turning to violence all in the name of God. There's something twisted about all of that. Now, for the third or fourth time in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 13, Jesus, again, on the Sabbath, is in the synagogue and he's teaching when this time it isn't a man with a withered hand it's a woman whose whole body is crippled for 18 years she has been bent over and only able to see the ground before her eyes and the feet of people around her hasn't been able to stand up and look people in the eye hasn't been able to stand and raise her hands and praise to God look into the heavens so Jesus calls her over too and he says woman be set free and he lays his hand upon her, and immediately she was healed. And instantly, the leader of the synagogue stood before all the people, enraged, and starts lecturing on how there are six days in which we can be healed, do work, whatever you need to do. Come any of those days. But on the seventh day, it's a day of rest. We're not supposed to do this, no matter how good a thing it is. And I got to tell you, I can understand a little bit of where he's coming from. I, I get his concern that if it's left to us to interpret the law and what we can determine as good, what we will determine as rest, that starts becoming a slippery slope. And I see where it's heading. I see where people will start posting on Facebook, <laughs> as I've seen. This is my Sabbath as they're laying on the dock at the lake. This is my Sabbath, as they're sitting on the couch with the remote watching Sunday morning football. This is my Sabbath. Instead of going to church, I'm digging in the dirt, working in my yard and garden, getting down deep, and this is where I'm centered with God. This is my Sabbath. Instead of going to church, I'm volunteering at a, a food shelter. Instead of going to church, this is my Sabbath. I'm, I'm helping people at the homeless shelter. This is my Sabbath. Instead of going to church, we're visiting the sick or the imprisoned. All the things that Jesus said. Going to the nursing home and helping or hospice house. All things that are good. And, and oh, that Jesus would inspire people to go out and serve the neighbor and do some good in the world, huh? But he never intended it to be at the expense of worship, at the expense of coming and honoring the Sabbath as God instructs in the Bible. But you can kind of see maybe sometimes where people are coming from. What is the world's impression of the church, of Christianity, of us Christians? Is their impression that that, that people show up and honor the Sabbath, but they never get out and do anything? They're so heavenly focused, they're no earthly good? Is there an impression that the people are so bent on rule keeping, but they do it with no compassion? Is, is people's impression of us, of the church of Christianity, that that it's just a bunch of infighting, everybody trying to tell everybody else how to live and what to do, and that, that if you don't do worship this way or that, if you don't wear a robe, it isn't legitimate, it isn't legitimate worship, you aren't really Lutheran or really Christian or whatever else. What are people's impressions of us in the church and Christianity? 
Isn't it that, that we're so focused on our traditions that aren't even in the Bible that we've lost perspective? Whether it's the liturgical year or wearing robes or whatever else, things that aren't even the Bible, it isn't necessarily that they're bad, but have they become so sacred that there are sacred golden cows? Are people's impression that we are so focused on preserving the institution that the institution has forgotten what its mission and ministry is? And you see that going on today as the decline of Christianity, congregations are faced with shutting their doors and it's all about paying the bills. It's all about keeping the doors open, forgetting what Jesus says. That those who want to save their life will end up losing it. Those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will find it. But you can kind of get, can't you? Why some people may say, I'd rather honor the Sabbath in other ways. There seems to be this tension between, on the one hand, these legalists who are wanting everything to be black and white and no wiggle room, and the other extreme of nebulism that, that wants to define for itself the law, which, by the way, all of our sinful selves want to do, don't we? None of us really want to live by other people's rules. God's, the government's, anyone else's. Let me, let me define my own laws, my own rules. But are these the only two options? Jesus says, what is the Sabbath for? The Sabbath is for you. It's a gift from God. In Exodus chapter 20, when Moses first gets the Ten Commandments, comes down off the mountain and delivers it to the people, he says that the reason for keeping the Sabbath is that God worked for six days and on the seventh day rested. And that is the very fabric of creation. That's the rhythm of life. That's what God wants for all of you. Work for six days, rest on the Sabbath, right? And if you don't, you're going to pay the price and the world is going to be worse off. Now, how many of you ever, ever tried to just work all the time, all the, the clock around, you know, 24-7, and suffered from sleep deprivation? What happens? You end up making mistakes. Your judgment is clouded. Productivity goes down, right? Rest is built into the very rhythm of life and fabric of creation, and when we don't honor it, we pay the price. The world pays the price. There is this voice inside of all of us that keeps telling us, you've got to do more, you can do better, work, work, work. And unless there's this outside voice that even makes it a law and says, you must rest, we probably won't. Unless you're like me, then we probably will. But, but a lot of you will probably just work and work. Somebody has to tell you, you have to rest, even if it's a law. But the second reason that we're to keep the Sabbath, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, at the end of the 40-year journey, Moses tells a whole new generation, verbatim the same thing, except the explanation of why to keep the Sabbath. This time Moses says, We've got to keep the Sabbath because we have to remember our bondage to slavery and we have to remember the freedom that God has given us. If we don't, we're going to start taking it for granted. We're going to start living like we're entitled. We have to remember this story and what God has done. Jesus says, look, I haven't come to do away with the law. I've come to fulfill it. There is another option between these two extremes. Here is a woman who for 18 years has been in bondage and hasn't experienced the freedom that we talk about on the Sabbath. Here is a woman for 18 years who has not experienced the gift of rest that God intends with Sabbath because she has been in pain and discomfort all this time, 24-7. Do you begin to think that if I heal this woman, it's really going to lead to her not coming to worship, not coming to praise God, but just sitting at the lake on the dock or in front of the football game? I'll guarantee you that she will be here to praise the Lord, standing up straight, looking you in the eye and praising God. 
And sure enough, he says, woman, be set free. He lays her hand, his hand upon her. She is made well and right away begins praising God in the synagogue on the Sabbath. I'll bet you anything she was there the next week. All of it boils down to this, sisters and brothers. In conclusion, Jesus is bound and determined to keep the Sabbath, even if he has to break it. Jesus is bound and determined to heal and to save, even if it kills him, even if he's condemned for it. Jesus is bound to love and to free, even if he's hated for it, even if it lands him in prison. Jesus is bound and determined to be for you, even when you're not showing up for him. Here is a man and a woman, a boy and a girl, a son and a daughter of God, a brother and sister in Christ who has come in bondage to sin, who has come to God's house to receive freedom, who has come to lay all your burdens on Jesus and to find rest for your weary souls. And you've come to the right place, sisters and brothers. By the mercy of Almighty God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. Satan has no power over you. Death will have no hold on you. Your sin does not define you. And the law is not your hope, but given only as a help. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Don't submit again to a yoke of slavery, but go in peace and serve the world in Jesus' name and the freedom of the gospel. Amen.